I, I was born in 1946, uh, 10 months after the end of World War II. My father was in the Navy uh, for 12 years prior to that and fought all the way through the, Jap uh, the Japanese, all the way through the World War. Um, I had a very bad upbringing and um, in the late 60s I broke with, well in the mid 60s I broke with the regular Christian church. Uh, it was the height of the Vietnam War. You may be all too young to remember the trauma of the Vietnam War, but um, uh, for me, the, the, uh, the, the Vietnam War was a true trauma. And I became very much dissatisfied with my Australian um, upbringing. And I, I was working for the government, and I hitchhiked around Australia. I left the government and hitchhiked around Australia, wound up in Darwin. And then in 69, uh, I went to um, Malaysia, Singapore, and Indonesia. And uh, after that, I went back to Australia and I decided I was going to go to Asia for good. Uh, I went back to Indonesia, the Eastern Islands, Timor, and uh, the Eastern Islands. And then I wound up in Hong Kong in 69. Um, when I was in Hong Kong, um, uh, I was staying at the YMCA and one night I came back and I was sharing the room and by my bed there was a copy of um, an introduction to Buddhism and my, I asked my roommate, did you put this there? And he said no. And I, I read it and I was reading it in a coffee shop and while I was reading it in this coffee shop, uh, an English artist, Martin Bradley, uh, saw me reading it and he asked me was I interested in Buddhism and I said uh, yes I was and he said would you like to meet a German Buddhist monk and I said yes I would and he took me out to Chunwan uh, which is in the new territories I don't know whether you know Chunwan but you you, yeah. you definitely would know Chunwan and I met this German Buddhist monk uh, quite an incredible fellow um, his family had uh, been uh, involved in uh, Nazi activities during the Second World War and his family had gone to Argentina at the end of the war where he learned Spanish and then he went back to England and learned English and then he started studying Chinese and he wound up in Thailand and um, I stayed with this monk for about two weeks in a small hut in Chunwan and then I went to uh, back to Hong Kong because I I could only stay there for a short time. And later I went to uh, Japan because I heard that you can teach English in Japan. So I went to Japan to teach English. And while in Japan, I uh, I became in, uh, involved with some Japanese so-called hippies <laughs> uh, who had a um, a commune out in uh, Kokobonji that was originally uh, founded by Sasaki and Gary Snyder. I don't know whether any of you know Gary Snyder, uh, uh, California poet, um, very famous as a sort of a beat generation figure. And at that time I was practicing meditation in uh, a small dojo in Japan. That was 1970. And something happened, I had to leave, I don't want to go into it, I had to leave Japan and I went to Taiwan um, through the Ryukyu Islands, which was under Amer American administration at that time. And I arrived back in Hong Kong. And um, when I got to Hong Kong, uh, I ran out of money. So I went out to see this German monk. And I asked this German monk, uh, did he have any ideas? And he said, well, we'll go next door and we'll ask the abbot. Um, uh, whether he can do anything to help. So he went next door and he said, well, we need a gardener in this monastery. Would you like to be the gardener? He said, we'll give you 300 Hong Kong dollars a month. You can eat the food with the monks and you can stay in this little place, this little shed where they're near the door. And I said, yes, I would. And after I was there, it was a very peaceful place and I began to study Chinese quite diligently and also I started, started to study Buddhism quite diligently. And after about six months the abbot asked me 
uh, would you like to become a Buddhist monk? And I said, okay. So in 1971, I became a Buddhist monk. And I lived in the monastery in Chunwan and later on out in Daishan in Lantau Island. Um, you've been to Lantau. Um, there's a big temple there called the Baolin Zi. Um, uh, but when you get to Baolin Zi, Baolin Zi is very a touristy temple. But as you go further back into the mountains, the, the, you get more practitioners. And uh, I was in uh, a place called Baolians, which is further back. Uh, it actually looks over what is now the modern airport. If you sit in the airport uh, departure lounge looking up the mountains, you can see this monastery where I used to stay. When I stayed there, this monastery had no electricity. Uh, we grew our own food, and I was there for about a year. And um, uh, I didn't speak English very often, um, and I had to speak mostly uh, Chinese, and so my Chinese got good, uh, or better, um, uh, but here's three photos if you want to pass them around of me as a Buddhist monk in, uh, in China, in, 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 and um, so I, I spent uh, a lot of time <laughs> One of the things about living in a Buddhist monastery, you get something quite invaluable that you just cannot buy, and that is free time. Mm -hmm. Basically, mm -hmm. I had to go to the morning service, Tsalka, and we would do the recitation, mm -hmm. and then we would do maybe uh, an hour's meditation, and then that would finish about uh, 6 o'clock in the morning from 4 to 6. And uh, then after the um, meditation was over, um, we would eat breakfast, and then I really was free to do whatever I wanted to until, until um, uh, evening service. And so I spent a lot of time studying uh, how to read Chinese Buddhist sutras, um, how to, I, I read a lot of books on, in English on Buddhism, uh, I read wider in Chinese culture also. Um, you know, when I was in Hong Kong in 1971, the Cultural Revolution was at its height. And Hong Kong was a very different place. Um, most of you would not know about the Cultural Revolution, but I saw it firsthand as a resident of Hong Kong in the monastery. Um, Hong Kong has changed very much since those days, um, and I can see the changes that have taken place, and I can understand some of the issues that are going on today. But for me, um, for me, uh, I had five years of time to study, to contemplate, to meditate. And in fact, uh, this totally changed my life. Um, I was never to be the same again. My, my master, Miao Jing Lao um, uh, was from Dongbei, which is the far north. And most of the monks in the monastery where I was staying, Dong Nian Nian Fatong, were northerners. So in the monastery, we spoke Goyu. And so I didn't learn Cantonese, even though I was in a Cantonese-speaking mm -hmm. city. And um, I learned uh, Mandarin, Goyu. And uh, my Shifu, uh, my master Shifu, is uh, later on went to America in 1972. Late 72, he went to America. And I felt very much abandoned by my Shifu because he didn't take me with me and I was... I was just struggling by myself. And in 1976, I was planning to go back to Australia. Uh, I wanted to work. I wanted to leave the order, and um, I wanted to leave the monastery, and I wanted to work and make money and come back to 
uh, Hong Kong with money in my pocket because I was always very poor. And um, just when I was about ready to go, my surfer came back from America and asked me, uh, do you want to go to America? We need you in America. And I had never thought about going to America. Uh, but I said yes. And um, they arranged a green card for me, and I flew to America.